Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I'm going to show you a lot of things and describe them and feel free to ask questions or throw things or whatever you like along the way. I'm going to start by showing you a little piece of video. It's short. It's about a minute or so long. And I'd like to do it without much explanation beforehand. Oh. Oh. What I call is, is, oh, oh, it's really, very, very difficult here. The log is going to run me. Are you ready, Troy? I'm ready. Here it comes. You okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. I got it. Uh -huh. How'd that one go? Better than the first. Okay. <laughs> I hope that most of you will agree that deserves some kind of prize. <laughs> and it got a prize. That was awarded an Ig Nobel Prize. That's a man named Troy Hurtabies. Troy spent seven years designing, building from scrounged materials, and per, as you can see, personally testing this suit of armor that's meant to protect him against grizzly bears. And Troy is a long, wonderful, ever continuing story. Um, let me show you some other things. And although I don't usually say it in public, underneath the surface of this, uh, one of the many uses of all of this stuff is it seems to get people curious about things that they thought they would never have the slightest bit of interest in and, uh, and maybe would hate for good reason. But it's hard to look at some of these things and not start to at least wonder and ask questions. So let me tell you about the Ig Nobel Prizes. We've been doing these for 14 years now. And these Ig Nobel Prizes are real. We give out 10 of them a year. And they're for this. This is the only criterion for winning an Ig Nobel Prize. It's that you've done something that has that funny quality. It first makes people laugh and then makes them think. What they think is up to them, but it has to have this quality. And the people all are real. Now, if you are selected to win an Ig Nobel Prize, you get several things. You get an Ig Nobel Prize. This is the prize that was given out in 2002. It's a different design every year. What's common across all of the years, across all of the designs, is that they're made of exceedingly cheap materials. <laughs> It's not easy to win an Ig Nobel Prize. There are, as I said, 10 of them given every year. But there are more than 5,000 nominations every year. They come flooding in every day. And it's getting harder and harder to choose from 5,000 or more, a mere 10. Um, we do get in touch with the people who are selected, at least when we're able to and give them the opportunity to turn it down if they think it might cause them some sort of problem. But very, very few people have turned down an Ig Nobel Prize. The ones that have almost always have done it because they have somebody who's already out to get them, typically their boss, and they don't want to hand them yet one more thing that can be used against them. 
Also, some years we have not been able to get in touch with the Ig Nobel Economics Prize winner because certain years the Economics Prize winner has had a previous five to 15 year engagement. <laughs> if you win, if you're one of the lucky 10 that wins an Ig Nobel Prize, and you don't decline it, you are given a prize if you come to the ceremony. You're invited to the ceremony, and when you get there, all sorts of things happen. You are also given this. It's uh, just a piece of paper. It's a certificate attesting to the fact that you've won an Ig Nobel Prize, and it's signed by several Nobel Prize winners. So it's a nice little thing to be able to take home. And I can tell you from having seen it firsthand, many of the winners keep this at home in the uh, laboratory. <laughs> uh, when you come to the ceremony, the ceremony is held at Harvard University up in Cambridge, Mass. And you have to pay your own way to get there. But many people do. Many people have come from literally halfway around the world at their own expense. Because when you get there, you come to Sanders Theater. This is the building. It's the oldest, largest, and by far the most dignified meeting place at Harvard except on the night when we have the ceremony. And it's always filled to capacity that night, 1,200 people who come from all over the place. And up on stage, waiting to hand out the prizes, are a bunch of Nobel laureates. And the, the truly most magical moments of the ceremony are when we announce each of the 10 winners, and they get up there. And a Nobel laureate gets up to hand them the prize. And it's really quite a, an almost indescribable kind of moment. It's, it's magical is the closest word. But when the Nobel laureate stands there shaking the hand of the Ig Nobel Prize winner, it's as if for the moment the universe has two opposite ends. And you're watching those two opposite ends of the universe meet and look each other in the eye. And neither one of them quite believes it. <laughs> Here, very quickly, are the most recent winners, the crop of 10 that we gave prizes to just a few months ago. So these are the 2003 Ig Nobel Prize winners. We gave the Ig Nobel Prize in the field of engineering to the late John Paul Stapp, the late Edward A. Murphy, Jr., and George Nichols for jointly giving birth in 1949 to Murphy's Law, a basic engineering principle that if there are two or more ways to do something, and one of those ways can result in a catastrophe, somebody will do it. Now, over the years, that's gotten simplified and shortened to the form that you probably have heard a little more often, which is, if anything can go wrong, it will. Most people, I think, are not aware that Murphy's Law came from a very specific incident and that there was a Murphy who was involved in that incident. And it's Murphy and two of the other people involved who shared the prize. This all happened in 1949 in California at Edwards Air Force Base out in the desert. And I'll show you a few pictures from the project. This was not long after World War II. The Air Force was wondering whether they should start building aircraft uh, to be a little stronger, because they were wondering very seriously had a lot of pilots died because their aircraft simply came apart when if the, the aircraft had been a little stronger, um, the pilots would have been fine. And they didn't know. They'd been basing all the engineering decisions at that point on an assumption. So this was the test of the assumption. They built a rocket sled on railroad tracks out in the desert. And what they did was get somebody to ride this they would, there were rockets on the back, and they would accelerate very quickly up to several hundred miles an hour and then stop it as quickly as they could. So these are the tests. That's John Paul Stapp, who was the medical officer on the project, who decided he couldn't bear the idea of letting somebody else ride it. So he became the test pilot on this stuff. Murphy entered into it because at some point they realized the whole point of this is to measure how much force the person's enduring while it's stopping. And they didn't quite have the electronics to do it. And they heard that there was a Captain Murphy out in Ohio in the Air Force who knew how to build the kinds of uh, equipment they needed, the, the particular transducer. So they called him up, described it. He built it. He came out. Technician installed it. They did a test run of this rocket sled, but with a dummy. Then they went and they read the gauges. And the gauges all said zero, as if there had been no test run, as if nothing had happened. So something had gone wrong. 
Murphy went over, looked at it, pulled out the gauges, recognized somebody had installed the gauges backwards and upside down. And it was at that moment that Murphy said whatever it was he said. Nobody wrote it down. Nobody thought it was that important, including Murphy. And it was only afterwards people wondered about the details. He went home. His whole involvement there was about two days. This was a great success, this project. They, in fact, found out the designs were based on very faulty assumptions. After this, they started building everything much stronger. A lot of lives were saved. There was a press conference a few months later. Stapp, this guy who wrote all this stuff, was the hero of the press conference. And a reporter asked him, how is it doing this extremely dangerous work that you weren't severely injured or, or worse? And he said, it's because we paid very careful attention to Murphy's Law. And they'd never heard anybody there, this phrase. So he explained what Murphy's Law was, how it's the key design principle that a good engineer uses. And the reporters fell in love with this and started spreading the word. So that's how the phrase Murphy's Law got spread around. Murphy didn't know there was a Murphy's Law for another 15 or 20 years. <laughs> it's now more than 50 years. Murphy is now dead. Stapp died a few years ago. Um, Stapp, by the way, also was the one who really came up with and pushed the idea that if this is how we protect pilots, and if more pilots die in car crashes than in plane crashes, which they did, we should put these seat belts in cars. And it's more because of Stapp than anybody else, including Ralph Nader, who got on the publicity end. But it's mostly because of Stapp that manufacturers have to build seat belts into cars now. Anyway, Stapp's gone. Murphy's gone. George Nichols, who was the project leader, is still alive. Uh, he lives out in Pasadena. Um, the three of them shared the prize. Nichols, by the way, didn't like Murphy. And George Nichols, to this day, wants the public to know that, as far as he's concerned, Murphy gets too much credit for Murphy's Law. <laughs> Here, uh, I'll just uh, show you a couple more. This is five photos, real quick. These were taken during the project. This is a camera mounted in the rocket sled looking at the guy riding. This is John Paul Stapp while he's stopping. And that's Murphy. That is the Murphy of Murphy's Law. This photo was taken just a few months ago. This is at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. Guy in the middle in the business suit, that's Ed Murphy III, the son of the Murphy of Murphy's Law, accepting the Ig Nobel Prize on behalf of his late father. The man in the blue shirt handing him the prize is Bill Lipscomb, who has a Nobel Prize in chemistry. The Ig Nobel Physics Prize last year was awarded to a team of seven scientists from Australia for their irresistible report called An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep <laughs> Over Various Surfaces. This is the beginning of their published report. You can go and get a copy of this. You will delight any librarian if you just walk in and ask for a copy of this thing. You can also find this on the internet. Uh, this is John Culvenor, one of the co-authors on the left, who traveled all the way from Australia to collect his Ig Nobel Prize. Handing it to him is Wolfgang Ketterle, who a couple years ago won the Nobel Physics Prize. He's one of the first people to make a Bose-Einstein condensate, which some of you know a lot about and others have seen in the news. And I'll mention that again later. Notice that he's holding an Ig Nobel Prize. That was the prize that we made last year. Last year, the theme of the ceremony was nano, which is really tiny, 10 to the minus ninth, very small. And we build the prize always to reflect that year's theme. So reflecting the theme of nano, what each Ig Nobel Prize winner got this year was a bar of solid gold. A bar of solid gold one nanometer long. <laughs> what the Nobel laureate handed to each Ig Nobel laureate was that lovely transparent plastic cube that you can see there. And the bar of gold is somewhere inside. <laughs> Here are some, uh, some technical drawings from the report, an analysis of the forces required to drag sheep across various surfaces. You're all familiar from your physics days with this type of diagram. <laughs> And like many of the things that have won Ig Nobel Prizes, this, uh, this had uh, considerable importance in a particular industry that the rest of the world doesn't happen to think about very much. This is uh, in a part of Australia where sheep shearing is an extremely big part of the economy. 
and dragging sheep happens all the time, and it's a problem. The Ig Nobel Medicine Prize was awarded to Eleanor McGuire and her team at University College London for presenting evidence that the brains of London taxi drivers are more highly developed than those of their fellow citizens. Here's the beginning of their published report that won the prize. They've since come out with a whole series of things. They've continued investigating this. And here is Eleanor McGuire, flown over from London to accept the prize. She's the woman, you know, the blonde woman in the white coat there. And you can see one of our attendants is using a little electric fan to help Eleanor keep her cool. And that's Dudley Hirschbach, who has a Nobel Chemistry Prize, who's handing her the Ig Nobel Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Psychology is awarded to Gian Vittorio Caprara and Claudio Barbarinelli of the University of Rome and to Phil Zimbardo of Stanford University for their discerning report, Politicians, Uniquely Simple Personalities. <laughs> this is the beginning of their published report. And this was published about six or seven years ago in an obscure little scientific journal called Nature, which many of you know is one of the two or three most prestigious places in the world to get published if you're a scientist. Many scientists would kill to get a single paper published in Nature, kill repeatedly some of them. And anyway, this was published in Nature, and there's Phil Zimbardo. Um, and many of you also know he's one of the world's best known and most influential psychologists. Uh, he's here bursting through the ceremonial curtain, about to receive his prize, waiting to hand it to him. On the right, in the blue shirt, is Rich Roberts, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine a few years ago. Um, Rich and uh, Phil Sharp shared the prize for discovering um, split genes or junk DNA. There are many names for it, but they were the ones who discovered that big stretches of our DNA do things that nobody really understands well. Anyway, that's Rich, uh, the guy wearing the, uh, the moose cap on the right, holding the Ig Nobel Prize. Oh, and this is an uh, uh, old picture from about 1955 of Phil Zimbardo, uh, the uh, Ig Nobel winner and past president of the American Psychological Association. Here he is as a graduate student. You can see the makings of greatness there, I think. <laughs> The Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize was awarded to Yukio Hirose of Kanazawa University in Japan for his chemical investigation of a bronze statue in the city of Kanazawa that fails to attract pigeons. Here is Professor Hirose about to happily accept his Ig Nobel Prize from Bill Lipscomb. Uh, there was a beautiful report in one of the big Japanese newspapers about three weeks ago. Somebody interviewed Professor Hirose about the effect that winning the Ig Nobel Prize has had on him. And he talked about how at first he wasn't sure whether this was a good or a bad thing. Um, now he's decided he really likes it, but it's, it's, it brought one problem, which is he has no free time. So. <laughs> The Ig Nobel Literature Prize this past year was awarded to John Trinkus, a professor at the Zicklin School of Business in New York City, for meticulously collecting data and publishing more than 80, that's more than eight zero, detailed academic papers about specific annoyances and anomalies of daily life. Most of these were things that caught his eye on the way into work or the way home from work. And so he started collecting data and published something eventually. Um, here are some examples. What percentage of young people wear baseball caps with the peak facing to the rear rather than to the front? What percentage of pedestrians wear sports shoes that are white rather than some other color? What percentage of automobile, automobile drivers almost but not completely come to a stop at one particular stop sign? What percentage of commuters carry attache cases? What percentage of shoppers exceed the number of items permitted in a supermarket's <laughs> express checkout lane? And what percentage of students dislike the taste of Brussels sprouts? This is the beginning of one of his reports. This is wearing baseball type caps and informal look. Uh, this is a stop sign, of course, and I'm showing it because I'm going to show you very quickly if, uh, one of his uh, stop sign related publications which is this. This is stop sign compliance and informal look. Five years after he published this, he published stop, stop sign compliance, another look. <laughs> and then five years after that, he published stop sign compliance, a further look. After another five years, he published stop sign <laughs> compliance, a follow-up look. 
And then five years later came stop sign compliance, a final look. Here is Professor Trinkus about to receive his Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, you can see also I'm holding something over his head. This was something special, something extra that the Ig Nobel Literature Prize winner that none of the other winners uh, got. This was um, a special something sponsored by the uh, Times of London, the newspaper, uh, on, in honor of the Literature Prize winner. It was a special framed copy of the poem Ode on the Mammoth Cheese, which of course was written by James McIntyre in 1884. And that's of course James McIntyre, the noted Canadian cheese poet. Uh, some of you may uh, not have uh, read that poem for a while now. Let me refresh your memory. <laughs> the title, of course, is a little longer than I said. The full title is Ode on the Mammoth Cheese Weighing Over 7,000 Pounds. And the poem begins, We have seen thee, queen of cheese, lying quietly at your ease, gently fanned by evening breeze. Thy fair form no flies dare seize. And it continues interminably like that. <laughs> so he got a special framed copy of that that was signed by four Nobel laureates. The Ig Nobel Economics Prize this year was awarded to Karl Schwarzler and to the nation of Liechtenstein for making it possible to rent the entire country of Liechtenstein <laughs> for corporate conventions, weddings, bar mitzvahs, and other gatherings. Here is Karl Schwarzler, who came over from Liechtenstein to accept the prize. And here is Liechtenstein. And here is Liechtenstein. And here, too, Liechtenstein. <laughs> The Ig Nobel Prize in the field of interdisciplinary research was, I should mention, when we give a prize in the field of interdisciplinary research, that just means we couldn't figure out how to categorize this. <laughs> this year's interdisciplinary research prize was awarded to Stefano Ghirlanda, Lisa Lott Jansen, and Magnus Enquist of Stockholm University in Sweden, and Stefano Ghirlanda is also based in Rome, Italy. They won the prize for their inevitable report, Chickens Prefer Beautiful Humans. This is the beginning of their published report. And here are the three co-authors who traveled over from Stockholm and from Rome to collect their prize. During the entire ceremony, at the back of the stage, behind whatever else is going on, there's a large uh, projection screen. And we're projecting images that help illuminate what's going on on the stage. So while they're giving their one minute acceptance speech. Behind them was this image of a chicken reacting to what is presumably a beautiful human. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Peace Prize, perhaps the most prestigious of the Ig Nobel Prizes, was awarded this year to Lal Bihari of Uttar Pradesh, India, for a triple accomplishment. First, for leading an active life, even though he's been declared legally dead. <laughs> A second, for waging a lively, posthumous campaign against bureaucratic inertia and greedy relatives. And third, for creating the Association <laughs> of Dead People. Is anyone here familiar with his plight and his solution? This is a problem that's fairly well known within India and barely whispered about outside the nation of India. It's been going on for a long time. If you own property and you have relatives who stand to inherit, who don't like you, in some places it's very easy for them to go to a government office, pay a tiny bribe, and I do mean tiny, and have you declared legally dead. And from the moment that happens, you're gone. You own nothing. People won't talk to you. You have no place to live. His relatives did that to him when he was about 18 or so. And for the first seven or eight years he was dead, he really didn't know what to do about it. And then he realized, that, first of all, that there are a lot of other people. He eventually discovered that there are, just in his province, only in his province alone, this is discounting in other provinces in, in, in India, more than 10,000 of these living dead. It's not a small problem. What he did was start to gather people. They formed the Association of Dead People, and they decided to try to shame these particular government officials into doing something about it. So they started holding public rallies. <laughs> and it started to work. 
a few people have now literally gotten their lives back because of Lal Bihari and his campaign. We thought that he was going to be able to make it over to the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. We came very close uh, because of a conjunction of things. There is a filmmaker in India named Satish Kaushik who is making a movie, a major movie, based on the life and death and life of uh, Lal Bihari. And Satish Kaushik offered to pay for Lal Bihari to travel from India, from his village in India, over to Harvard to get his prize and back, and offered to try to persuade the Indian government to give a passport to Lal Bihari. <laughs> we didn't think he was going to be able to do this, but he did. He somehow managed to persuade the, the Indian government to give a passport to Lal Bihari. We were all set. All kinds of people were, were preparing all kinds of wonderful things, because we thought, this, this is a very special case. This man really, what he, the work he's doing deserves, for lots of reasons, to be better known. But then it didn't quite happen, uh, because although he got a passport from the Indian government, the United States government refused to give a visa to Lal Bihari. So apparently being dead was just the beginning of his problems. Um, so Satish Kaushik flew one of his associates, one of his fellow filmmakers, over. This is Madhu Kapoor, who flew over to Harvard and accepted the prize on behalf of Lal Bihari. And about a month or two later, they had a ceremony back in his village. And somebody from the Indian government, um, it was quite a nice thing, officially presented his Ig Nobel Prize to him. There is Lal Bihari. That's a photograph of Lal Bihari. Looks surprisingly good, does he not? <laughs> And he sent us a photograph of one of the uh, public rallies held by the Association of Dead People. So here's a picture of one of their rallies. <laughs> this is a very clever man. And finally, the tenth prize that we gave out last year was in the field of biology. And the Ig Nobel Biology Prize was presented to C.W. Moliker of the Nature Museum in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, for documenting the first scientifically recorded case of homosexual necrophilia in the mallard duck. <laughs> this is his published scientific report. Here, too, let me suggest, go to a library and ask the librarian, possibly in a loud voice, if you can have a copy of this. Oh, if you don't want to do that, you can get a copy on the internet. Here is <laughs> C.W. Moliker, who flew over from Rotterdam to Harvard, uh, gave his acceptance speech, and then pulled out a stuffed mallard duck. And uh, I've uh, got some, uh, some little pictures from the report that he's given me to show. This is the Nature Museum in Rotterdam, where he works. They put up this new wing of the museum a few years ago. It's got a glass side. And sometimes uh, birds don't see the glass and fly into it. So the staff there pretty quickly got used to hearing thwack, thwack, thwack. And uh, one day, they heard an especially loud and strange bang. And uh, Case Moliker went to the window and looked out. And he saw uh, that a mallard duck had flown into the window at extremely high speed. So it was going so fast that it died on impact, fell to the ground. While he was watching, a second mallard duck flew in, but not to the side of the building. It flew, landed next to the first one, and started uh, engaging in activity with the first one. So being a good scientist, Case Moliker went and got his, his pencil and paper and a camera <laughs> and sat there looking out the window, um, taking careful notes uh, for 75 minutes. <laughs> and then he published it. Here, you can see in the museum, A is the window from, uh, from which he was watching, uh, or from which he first saw this stuff happen. B is the point at which the, uh, the approximate point at which the first duck uh, collided with the building. And C is where the window is where Case Moliker went and sat down to get a close view of the whole thing. Um, these are a couple of pictures, uh, action shots, I guess you could say, from his published report. And here are some mallard ducks. Uh, Something that's gone on the last couple of years is the British Association for the Advancement of Science and the Times of London have uh, sponsored me and a bunch of the Ig Nobel winners to travel around Great Britain during their National Science Week. So Case Mullican and a bunch of others came in. We were doing this to uh, 
to, to show the public some, some bits and pieces of science that they probably wouldn't get a chance to see. So Case was traveling around to about nine different British cities. This was just a month and a half ago, um, bringing the duck with him. And now all kinds of people in the UK are quite familiar with this story. Um, <laughs> Now, there's a, a lot of engineering that goes into making this ceremony work. Since we have all of these people on stage, all of the Ig Nobel winners and all the Nobel Prize winners and lots of other stuff that we do, we want to keep it to a reasonable length. So we have what is generally known as the Academy Awards ceremony problem, uh, which is how do you keep people to keep their speech, their, each other, excuse me, how do, you, how do you make people stop talking? How do, you, how do you make sure that they don't go on at length? And you want to do it in a way where you're not making them feel uncomfortable and you're not looking like an ogre. And a few years ago, we finally came up with a solution to this. It worked quite well. We call the solution Miss Sweetie Poo. This is Miss Sweetie Poo. She's a very cute eight-year-old girl. And she sits on the side of the stage, up there on the stage, during the entire ceremony. We introduce her at the start of the evening. And we explain that whenever Miss Sweetie Poo feels that somebody has talked long enough, she'll let them know. And then I ask her to come over and demonstrate. And she walks all the way across the stage up to the person at the microphone, and looks up at them and says, please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. And she doesn't stop until they do. <laughs> and it really works. When we do it at the start of the ceremony, the intimidation factor is just a wonderful thing to behold. The first year we did it, the ceremony was an entire hour shorter than it had been the year before. And we've kept it to that length ever since. So we decided we are not going to patent this technology. We want this to be available to anybody. There's a shot of Miss Sweetie Poo in action. Uh, that's Charles Paxton from England. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. He, um, he's part of the team that won the biology prize for a report they published called Courtship Behavior of Ostriches Towards Humans Under Farming Conditions in Britain. And he was just starting to tell the crowd when, well, by the way, well, I'll tell you the by the way in a minute, but they, they get more than just the little 60 second slot that we give them that night. Um, just a quick look at some other stuff in the ceremony. Every year the Ig Nobel ceremony also includes a win a date with a Nobel laureate contest. So what you're seeing here is the contest in which Bill Lipscomb, the uh, Nobel laureate in chemistry, was the prize. And this shot was taken from behind the stage. So he's out there scanning the audience, curious about who's going to win a date with him. And one of our attendants is trying to keep him calm during this period. And the next picture shows the winner collecting her prize. Um, Professor Lipscomb, by the way, is 84 years old. <laughs> And uh, people sometimes ask, what do they do on these dates? And I'm afraid I, I can't tell you because we have a sort of don't ask, don't tell policy on this. One year, we commissioned a ballet that was performed by professional dancers and three Nobel laureates. Uh, what you're <laughs> seeing here is the world premiere and only performance of the interpretive dance of the electrons. And that's Professor Lipscomb there. He's the one in the white coat. And every year for the past eight or nine years now, we've written a little opera, which we usually call a mini opera, about some topic in science. And it's performed by professional opera singers and a bunch of Nobel laureates. Uh, this past year, where our theme was nano, we, instead of writing a mini opera, wrote a nano opera. And I have just a couple of photos here. This nano opera was called Atom and Eve. And Adam and Eve was a romance. It was a romance between a lovely female scientist and an oxygen atom. And they had some obvious difficulties to be overcome. You're seeing here uh, Eve just looking in the microscope and discovering something wonderful down there on the nanoscale, something she'd never imagined would exist in that particular kind of place. And here is little Adam, who, who feels some enormous force 
larger and of a different type than anything he'd ever felt before. And a couple of days after the ceremony, we do ask the winners to stick around. And we have an afternoon of free public lectures, because we always felt the first few years it was a shame that the, the, the people who come to the ceremony only get to see a minute or so of, of these winners, because they all have really wondrous and wonderful tales to tell. So we have an afternoon of free public lectures down the street at MIT. You're seeing part of the audience here. Uh, most of the people in the front row there are winners. I'll just mention one of them. The, the gentleman on the left, the uh, Japanese man with the dyed blonde hair, is one of the co-inventors of something called Baolingual. You may have read about. Baolingual is a little computerized device that translates dog language to human language. <laughs> and uh, the winners, uh, most of them, it was a big team actually involved to do that, flew over from Japan to collect their prize and give a demonstration. And they came back the next year because they had such a good time the first year. <laughs> and they've sold a lot of these devices, too. <laughs> and the audience, of course, at these ceremonies, is, uh, <laughs> the lectures is wrapped. So that's a little bit about the Ig Nobel Prizes. Uh, recently collected the stories uh, in a little more depth of some of the winners and put them into the form of a book. So if you're curious to learn more about some of these people, including Troy and his grizzly bear suit, you can read about it in the book. I also want to talk to you about a, a broader range of things we do. I am the editor of a magazine called The Annals of Improbable Research. And I'll probably forget to mention it later, but I brought a bunch of them, which you're welcome to take at the end of this, if you remember that I brought a bunch for you to take. So I'll show you a little bit about improbable research. Uh, these are things from around the world that uh, we've written about. Some of them are things people have written about specifically for our journal. Others are things we've reported on. Here are a couple of recent covers of the magazine. On the left is the cover from our special beauty issue. And uh, that's uh, Diane DeMassa, who's a professor of marine engineering at, um, at, uh, at the university that I can't remember because she just switched universities. But um, she is there because she is a member of the Luxuriant Flowing Hair Club for Scientists. Uh, to be a member of the club, you need only two things. You need to have luxuriant flowing hair, and you need to be a scientist. And on the right is one of our special Ig Nobel issues. One of the six issues of the magazine every year is devoted intensively to the, the Ig Nobel winners from that year. Uh, here's just a little bit about the luxuriant flowing hair club for scientists. If anyone in this room has luxuriant flowing hair and is a scientist and would like to become a member, just talk to me afterwards. Or you can go to the website and join up. Or if you know somebody, if you have a colleague who should be a member, just let them know that this is, is a, an opportunity that's available to them. Uh, this is Steven Pinker, a psychologist who, Steven Pinker is a member. In fact, he was the founding member. Um, here is Diane DeMassa. Uh, who's at Mass Maritime Academy, which I apologize for not completely remembering the name of before. Uh, here are the three Bobro sisters, uh, scientists in different fields. And when they sent in their nomination, they pointed out that between the three of them, they have more than seven feet of luxuriant flowing hair. And here is Dr. Piero Paravadino, a <laughs> chemist from Italy, who also is a guitarist in a heavy metal rock band. So he is... <laughs> Uh, one of two members of the Luxuriant Flowing Hair Club for Scientists who also is really a rock star. And he was chosen as the Luxuriant Flowing Hair Club for Scientists Man of the Year for 2002 and 3. One of our editors, Karen Hopkin, who is a biochemist and a co-author of one of the leading cell biology textbooks, is probably a little better and, and more widely known, not, not for her work in uh, biology, but because she conceived of and created the Stud Muffins of Science calendar. This is one of the calendars. Karen uh, recruited scientists from all over. And the calendar, of course, has 12 months. So there's a Dr. January, Dr. February. This, I believe, is Dr. <laughs> December. And if anyone's interested in being part of the calendar in the future, also uh, get in touch with me, and I can put you in touch with Dr. Hopkin, who will look over whatever needs to be looked over. <laughs> uh, 
here are a couple of things we've published in the last few years that seem to have made little splashes. Now, before there were Teletubbies, dinosaurs roamed the Earth, or at least dinosaurs roamed television. You uh, are most of you familiar to some extent with uh, something called Barney the Dinosaur. Uh, it's often discussed on television, reported on television, and always called Barney the Dinosaur. Three scientists from the Philadelphia area saw these television reports, and they know a lot about dinosaurs. They had never seen a dinosaur that looked remotely like Barney. This is a <laughs> specimen of Barney. And so they set out to answer the simple question, is Barney the dinosaur really a dinosaur? And they're in a business where people are always bringing all kinds of animals and all kinds of fossils to them and saying, what is this? What's it related to? Where does it come from? So they applied all of the same tests to Barney the dinosaur that they would apply to any kind of specimen that was new to them. And in this case, they got lucky. This is the only dinosaur of which anyone knows that's still alive. All other kinds of dinosaurs are long extinct. They heard that a specimen of Barney would be appearing at a local shopping mall. So they rushed over there with some equipment and they found sure enough there was a living Barney dancing around surrounded by human children. And they managed to get an x-ray of Barney the dinosaur. This they regard as their most important piece of evidence in, in determining what exactly is this creature related to. So here is their x-ray of Barney the dinosaur. <laughs> Let me draw your attention to the skeletal structure, which, as they pointed out, is different from the skeletal structure of all other known kinds of dinosaur, and yet seems to resemble quite a bit the skeleton of human beings. So this piece of evidence and a bunch of others that they came up with led them to a conclusion. They, they have two theories, and they say it's likely that one or the other of these theories explains Barney the dinosaur. The first theory is that Barney is not a dinosaur, that Barney is rather a hominid and is distantly related to human beings. And the other theory is that there's some kind of fraud going on here. <laughs> a few years ago, Scott Sanford, who works for NASA out in California, published this report with us, Apples and Oranges, a comparison. You probably have heard people comparing two things to you or, or saying that's like comparing apples and oranges. And he'd heard that quite a bit and never quite was sure what they meant. So being a scientist and having access to a lot of expensive equipment, he decided to do this properly. You probably know or vaguely remember that if you have any kind of substance, any physical substance, and you want to know what are the chemical elements that comprise this substance, you can do it by just burning a little bit of it and analyzing the light, pass it through a prism or the equivalent. And the colors of light in there will tell you indirectly what are the chemicals inside this. So that's what he did. He, he burned a little specimen of apple and analyzed the light. And then he took some scrapings from an orange, dried that and burned it, and analyzed the light. And he discovered that when you do a proper scientific comparison of apples and oranges, they're virtually identical. <laughs> the Washington Post asked permission to reprint this article a few years ago, which they did just before a congressional election. And they ran it with a little editorial saying, in the upcoming election, you're probably going to hear all kinds of people uh, accusing each other of comparing apples and oranges. We're publishing this report so you'll know what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> a number of years ago, we published a report that still is uh, resounding around the world in many ways, feline reactions to bearded men. In this project, cats were exposed to photographs of bearded men. When they began, the scientists <laughs> used photographs of this bearded man. This is Robert Bork, the former Supreme Court nominee, who has a dis distinctive form of beard known as an underbeard. So this was begun, the work was well underway, but then it was halted by animal rights activists. <laughs> so the scientists had to begin over again. And the second time around, they used photographs of 
other types of bearded men, but avoided this type of beard. Uh, here's a picture of the research as it was being conducted. 200 cats were involved in this study. The work altogether took about seven months. And at the end of that time, the researchers concluded that basically cats are indifferent to photographs <laughs> of bearded men. Last year, we published this report, Kansas is flatter than a pancake. This is a photograph of the state of Kansas. And this is a photograph of a pancake. And as you can see, <laughs> although many people say Kansas is as flat as a pancake, that's not so. Kansas is considerably flatter than a pancake. The three scientists who wrote this, uh, one is in Texas, two in Arizona, um, and they're all fairly young, starting out in their careers. This was the first thing that really got a lot of public attention for any of them. <laughs> and they got a lot of attention. They were written up in newspapers around the world, TV reports, NPR, all over the place. And they were, were very pleased. This, it's unusual for a young scientist to get much attention at all from anybody outside even their department. They were very pleased until they started getting hate mail from Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Although, after the hate mail came, we got a phone call from the director of tourism for the state of Kansas <laughs> saying that this might be the best thing that's come along <laughs> in years. <laughs> oh. uh, here are some reports that uh, we've gathered where people have told us about and we've gotten copies of. These are published in research journals around the world. And there are lots of research journals. There are well more than 10,000 scientific research journals being published. So it's quite true that there is nobody who can at all even begin to keep up with literature, or even probably keep up with just the names of the fields within science. There's so much being studied. Uh, this is a paper called The Effects of Pre-Existing Inappropriate Highlighting on Reading Comprehension. And this won an Ig Nobel Prize for its authors a few years ago. This report was from a veterinary medical journal in India, and the title is Estimation of the Total Surface Area in Indian Elephants. This was overturning uh, the use of the previous method for estimating surface area in Indian elephants. Let me show you a couple of the technical drawings from this report. <laughs> <laughs> this report also won an Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> this is not a scientific uh, research paper. This is from a patent that was granted in 1965. You can get a copy of this patent from the patent office. The inventors are a married couple named George and Charlotte Blonsky. And they describe this invention as a device to assist women in giving birth. And this device to assist women in giving birth consists of a large round table and some machinery. When the woman is about ready to deliver her child, she lies on her back on the table, they strap her down, and then the table is rotated at high speed. <laughs> and thanks to centrifugal force, And um, finally, just a few little images that people have sent us. These are things that people saw in microscopes. And uh, there's more in nature sometimes than you can, you can quite imagine. This is a photomicrograph um, of a sample of tungsten. And this was magnified about 30,000 times. So this is really tiny. It's far smaller than you could possibly see with just your eye unaided. And as you can see, there's an interesting pattern. And this is a <laughs> Bob Dylan album cover from about 1970, magnified about five times. This illustrates the, the old saying, which is quite true, that patterns recur in nature again and again. <laughs> this was taken with an electron microscope. The scientist who sent this to us said that this is the fossilized remains of some kind of microbe that is probably long extinct. He said that what look like eye holes probably are, are not eye holes. They're probably holes for little antennae. But whatever, it's beautiful, isn't it? 
And if you know anybody who has any images like this, please ask them to send us a copy. We love to publish these things. We love to put them on the cover if they're striking enough. And finally this. <laughs> and this is it's just a cell. So if you want to see more information about any of this stuff, uh, look in the magazine. I hope you'll subscribe. It's really inexpensive, 29 bucks a year. I hope somebody here will consider writing for us. If you have some research that the world ought to know about, and it has that quality that when people first hear about it, it makes them laugh, and then afterward they find themselves thinking about it. If you've done something like that, please write it up and please submit it to us. There are also lots of other things. Uh, we now have a weekly newspaper column in The Guardian in London, uh, a blog, all sorts of stuff. You can see last year's Ig Nobel ceremony, all of it, video, up on our website. And I hope you'll take a look. These people I showed you pictures of, you can actually see them and hear them in action. Um, all that's at www.improbable.com. So just keep your eyes open. And within your own field, if you're a scientist and if you're not a scientist, whatever you do every day, the first week or so you started doing it, there were probably all kinds of things that were really interesting and funny and wonderful to you that you now don't pay any attention to. Things that you, at the time, thought, I, I need to look into this a little more. And you never quite got around to it. See if you can look at things for even five minutes that way. And if you find something really good, send it in to us to publish. So that's all the stuff. I, I'll take some questions. Before I do, if you want, and only if you think you can tolerate it, I have another little minute-long video clip of Troy Hurtabees testing his bear suit in a very different way. Anybody be? Okay. These are all, by the way, from a documentary film that was made by the National Film Board of Canada. It was never really shown in theaters here, but you can rent it. It's called Project Grizzly. You can see lots of the tests. And you can also see what happened when Troy got in his bear suit and took it out into the woods to try to find a grizzly bear. Anyway, here's Troy in his bear suit. Um, I'll try to give you a little more sound to it this time. Um, I want to say one word about Troy. Whatever, <laughs> whatever you may think about Troy's decision to spend so much of his life working on this and subjecting himself to these forces, that is the right word in this case, whatever you may think about that, good or bad, and I know some people think Troy is the best example of a crackpot they've ever seen, um, but whatever you may think of that, keep in mind he's still alive. <laughs> this is a man who is very careful. This is a quality that all of the best inventors have, and not many other people do. There are very few people on Earth who could subject themselves to years and years of this and still be walking around. Oh, and Troy, a week from now, is going to put his bear suit up for auction on eBay. <laughs> so if you know someone who has a use for it, now is the time. Okay. Now, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, Fire away, please. Yes? I came in a little late, but did you explain how you got into this? No. The question is, how did I get involved with this? Um, about 15 years or so ago, I, I had a software company that I'd started and was running. And I've always written things like this uh, since I was a little kid. And I finally decided one day, gee, I wonder if I could ever get some of this stuff published. So I put together a little package of it, mailed it off to a, a journal, to a science journal. And uh, a few weeks later, I came home, and there was a message on my answering machine saying, hi, this is the publisher of the journal. We got your articles. Would you be the editor of the magazine? So that's. <laughs> <laughs> and then the first year, I decided, because I was suddenly meeting all kinds of interesting people, and a surprising number of people came up to me merely because I was the editor of something involved with science. And they wanted my advice on how they could win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and it made no sense to me that they were asking me. Um, but also, with a lot of them, it was really clear they were, they're never going to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but a small percentage of them it was also clear 
this deserves something. <laughs> and that more or less is how the Ig Nobel Prize was born. In the first year, we told some people, and, and uh, winners came. I invited some Nobel laureates. They came. Some reporters came. Somebody at MIT, which is where we had it the first few years, offered to let us use some space there. And the first year, it worked well. Word got out. And because it worked well the first year, it's just grown and grown and grown ever since. We moved it down the road four years later to Harvard, and now it's going in a lot of ways international, too. But we're trying very hard to maintain the purity of the Ig Nobel experience for the winners. So thank you very much. Oh, and take a magazine when you go.